One of the topics that I was very excited to learn more about at the Garden Writers Conference was rain gardens. And we're fortunate enough today to get to visit a rain garden and visit with Assistant Professor Helen Kraus from North Carolina State University. Helen, thanks for having us at your well, home today. Thank you today. very much. I appreciate you being here. I really enjoyed learning about rain gardens. And I think one of the very important things is maybe people don't understand why do we build rain gardens and what functions can they provide us in the landscape? Right. Rain gardens actually provide two functions in the landscape. One, they're designed to capture water mm -hmm. so that they grow beautiful garden plants. Without supplemental irrigation or with very limited irrigation, you can grow a beautiful garden. But the other really important aspect is, is it filters pollution out of runoff water so that when rainfall falls on your landscape, it picks up debris, it picks up bits of grass and mulch and soil and it picks up grease from your car or oil or and it washes all that down into the stormwater collection system mm -hmm. uh, which then deposits that right into a lake or a stream and so it's this polluted water mm -hmm. uh, that can cause fish kills and, and can pollute our drinking water. Yeah, eventually all the water comes right back right, and cycles exactly. back into right. our house. Absolutely. Now I was interested to learn about some of the different pollutants. You did mention um, oils and such mm -hmm. that are on your driveway, from your cars, mm -hmm. the chemicals on our roof. But one that I thought was very interesting were just grass clippings and other organic matter. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's really kind of a amazing thing that you, if you look at my driveway here, it's covered right now in, in pine straw from my pine trees. Mm -hmm. And that's an organic plant constituent and when it decomposes in water it releases nitrogen and phosphorus and micronutrients like iron and zinc which to the plant was a plant essential nutrient but in water is a pollutant. Mm -hmm. It feeds algae. Algae grows and blooms into large populations which consume all the oxygen in the water and mm -hmm. can kill fish. So just something as simple as a pine needle or a, a piece of mulch can end up being a pollution okay. agent. Okay. Well, let's look at how we can prevent some of these things from getting into our waterways through the use of rain gardens. I okay. think the first question is, where are we going to put them in the landscape? Right. Well, I'd like to take you back to my rain garden and show you where we did in my yard and, okay. and what the purpose for my rain garden was. Okay. But you might want a series of rain gardens in your yard, too. That's so, true. Okay, thank let's you. take a look. The backyard is where we decide to locate the rain garden. Um, and there's a lot of different locations you can have for a rain garden. But for us, we had a problem where um, water was kind of sheeting down the backyard mm -hmm. here. And it would go down and it would follow the path and take all my mulch out onto the driveway. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I just was tired of that. And so we decided to locate the rain garden where we could sort of intercept that runoff water and prevent that that sort of localized erosion that was going on. Okay, and there's a few considerations then, also more general considerations right. about the location. This one's very sp specific, but it's not it's not the bottom of the hill, right. I noticed. Right, yes. The, uh, the best actually location is a midway point okay. on the hill. The bottom of the slope is very wet soil usually. All the water from the hill is drained down mm -hmm. there. Uh, so you want, really want it kind of on the midpoint. Uh, and then you can dig into that slope and, and create the rain garden. Another lo good location is just to take the downspout from your gutter and mm -hmm. put a drainage pipe on the downspout and direct that runoff from your roof right into the rain garden. So we were talking about having a kind of a combination of rain gardens. Mm -hmm. I have, this is the only one built in my landscape right now, but I have plans for a couple of more where I've got spots where runoff is happening okay. and I can kind of sort of catch it in catch other parts some of, of the that, landscape. Some yeah. of the water coming off the roof. But there was one other application with some of that water coming off the roof. Why don't we go take a look at that? Okay, it's just right over this way. So in the side yard over here by the air conditioner, I have a rain barrel uh, put in, and it's a 300-gallon rain barrel, mm -hmm. which gives me lots of irrigation whenever I have a dry spell I need to irrigate something. I just have the gutters plumbed into the rain barrel to catch that water. Okay. And then I've got a, a valve. Mm -hmm. and it connects to this irrigation line right here and I use use it to direct drip irrigation 
uh, to water my strawberry patch mm -hmm. right here. But also it carries this water down the hill to my perennial border that's on the front of the hill here. And I've got drip irrigation there, uh, all fed by the rain barrel. And it's using uh, gravity to push the water out Just to, the to end. create the pressure, exactly. Mm -hmm. Drip irrigation really needs only 10 to 15 pounds per square inch of pressure. So it doesn't take a lot of water and a lot of drop in elevation to really create that pressure. Okay. And it's worked great for me on that. The slope of the perennial border would otherwise be really hard to irrigate. It sure, it sure would. Now, even though you have a 300 gallon <laughs> cistern, it gets full. What it happens does. then? Uh, it has an overflow pipe mm -hmm. and you can see I've, I've snuck this it's little overflow pipe here through the bushes uh -huh. and it's going to dump out right here and I'm going to make another rain garden right here. Uh, rain gardens need to be at least 10 feet from the foundation okay. so you don't trap moisture next to the home. Uh, but I've already got this natural depression right here that I'm just going to make take advantage of for a little rain garden it's right asking here. Asking for one. Are yes. there other locations we want to avoid septic systems or anything like uh, that? We need to stay at least mm -hmm. um, 25 feet from a septic field mm -hmm. and at least 50 feet from a well head. So okay. just to make sure you don't focus any more pollution at a well. Okay. Well, this is going to be a great application for a rain garden. And we're going to go visit with Ann Spafford to look at how uh, we would construct a rain garden. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Joining us now is Ann Spafford, a horticulture professor at NC State. Now, Ann, you were involved with installing Helen's rain garden here. Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, how-to, how this is done, and what components sure. go into it? Um, it's about um, from where I'm standing over to that brightly colored grass, mm -hmm. and we did it in just over a day, and we dug it out so the base actually had the shape of a pie plate. Okay. Um, we went down about six inches. We used some of the existing soil. We hauled it to the low side to build up a berm so okay. the water doesn't outflow very quickly. Mm -hmm. We amended the rest of the soil with compost. A lot of people will think they should be amending with sand, but in heavy clay soils, sand and, sand and clay makes for a really good brick. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we're using compost with our soils. That does a couple things. One is it provides a lot of air space so the plants can grow out and have nice root space. Um, it also provides nutrients that the plants need, mm -hmm. but it also provides the microbes which tend to, they're the factory of the rain garden, they tend to eat away at the pollutants that come in there. So the compost is really important. When we excavated out the soil, we kind of spread two inches of compost on it, tilled it in, so, put it back into the hole. Okay, and we have a lot of clay in our soils in Oklahoma, so I'm that's going to be a good... <laughs> yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but that's a good application for us as well to mix that in. So we have uh, pushed some of the excess soil to the back and created a berm, and that'll just keep the water from rushing through. Exactly. And the next step. The next thing is, might sound a little odd, you actually want to put some rockery or some type of other hardscape at the mm -hmm. front to slow down the water that's going in. Okay. And it looks like water can't get in, but you can see there's actually plenty of pore space yeah. between. So as water's coming mm -hmm. across the lawn, it slows down before it goes into the rain garden. So there isn't a big um, washout. Okay, Can so just help we, reduce some of the erosion, take care of our plants a little bit. Exactly, so. exactly. Okay. And then we planted and then we mulched. Okay. And can you tell me just a few basics? I know we have a little bit different types of plants that we can grow, but what are some of the basic guidelines when you're selecting okay. plants for the rain garden? The most important thing is to, no matter where you are, pick plants that can tolerate standing water and periods of drought. Like where we are, we get a lot of rain a year we're supposed to, but when we get it, we get a lot at once and then we mm -hmm. have to go for months of nothing. So you want to make sure you can pick plants <laughs> that not only survive in standing water and drought, but also look fabulous and, and be beautiful throughout all four seasons. And that's exactly, it's a garden just like any other garden. So we want to plant for the seasons, mix it up a little. We can use evergreens as well as herbaceous Absolutely. material. Absolutely. In this garden, you know, we we're thinking of seasons and we're kind of between seasons right now, but you can see that the asters are just now coming in for the mm -hmm. fall color. Um, the salvia is still going. That's been salvia blooming all good. summer and it'll go until frost. We had spirea for summer color. We had irises for spring. Mm -hmm. So same thing where you are, you want to still plan for four seasons of interest. So make sure that the garden looks as beautiful as you can, as possible year round. Okay. Well, that's 
some really good planting tips. There's some general design things like you want to combine evergreens and deciduous plants, but also like Helen's garden is in the shade and you can have a rain garden anywhere, whether it's in sun, That's part shade, point. shade. Mm -hmm. And in Helen's garden, um, she relies a lot on different foliage colors. So you can see the carex mm -hmm. that comes through here. There's this yellow variegated one, the white one. So she gets a lot of color through foliages. We're also relying on flowers mm -hmm. and then just using contrast and, te and textures whenever we can. Okay. Now you and Helen wrote a book about rain gardening. We did. And um, this has some really good information in it. We did. It's, um, it's, it's for homeowners. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very uh, technological, uh, not technically oriented. Exactly, yeah. not technically oriented. The information is in there, but it's fun, it's easy to read. We think we're both hilarious, so there's some humor <laughs> in here. But it goes through um, why you should have one, the steps to build one. There are also plant lists that are organized by sun, shade, part shade. And again, that will change depending on mm -hmm. where you are, but the general information is applicable anywhere. Right. So just be aware that if you're looking at the plant list, that may shift a little bit depending on where, you, where you're doing your rain garden. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate all the information. Thanks. Thanks.